Hello, good morning, good evening, good afternoon uh, from all the various parts of the world we are joining from. My name is Rohit and I'm really excited you, to welcome you all for today's Awakened Talk. Welcome and thank you for joining us. The purpose of these talks is to share stories that help plant seeds for a more compassionate society while fostering our own inner transformation. We do this by holding collective conversations with guest speakers from all walks of life who inspire us to live in a more service-oriented way. And behind each of these calls is an entire team of service space volunteers whose invisible work allows us to hold this space. And the theme of our call today is intelligence of the heart. And we have some remarkable speakers with us who will share some insights and stories from their journey of cultivating that intelligence within them and circulating it around the world. So in the first part of the call, we'll have Nipun engage in a dialogue with our guest speakers. And in the second part, we'll have a chance to broaden the dialogue and hear from more hearts in the room uh, to build on that intelligence from many hearts. So at any point during the talk, if you'd like to offer a question or a reflection, please do so via the comment box in the live stream page where you're watching this conversation. And I would also like to take the opportunity to welcome some friends who have joined on Zoom. So if you would like to share a question or reflection on uh, any time, please send it on chat to me. And thank you for again for all of you for joining us. And first, we'll start with an invocation by a dear friend of our community, Radhika, who is like a really big hearted, remarkable Sufi vocalist. Welcome, Radhika. Thank you, Rohit. Good morning to all from India, Mumbai. Rohit, am I audible? Yes. I want to make an offering of a uh, Bullesha Kafi. Uh, Bullesha is a Sufi poet from 17th century Punjab. And uh, in this Kafi, he talks about, uh, he talks about not knowing. He says, I know not who I am. Ki jana mein kaun? And then he goes on to negating all the identities that we hold on to all our lives. He says, I'm not a Muslim who resides in mosques. I'm not a pagan. I'm not the one who follows any pagan rituals. I'm not made of the five elements. I am not a Hindu, nor from Peshawar, nor a Turk. I am not born of Adam and Eve. I'm not, found, I'm not to be found in joy or sorrow, in roaming, or sitting, in meditation. He negates all the pursuits that we, we, uh, we, uh, we follow to find ourselves. Finally, he says, I, I found myself to be the first and the last. Avval and Akhir. Is, it's me, my soul. And the last line says, Bulla Shaw Kera Hai Korn. So here's Bulla, the poet with his shaw, his shawher, his master, his beloved. And he says, now we are one. I can't tell one from the other. Bulla shaw keda hai kaun? I can't. We are, we are so one. So the soul is so part of the source that uh, all the other identities are, are uh, unnecessary. <coughs> Na mai mumin vi 
ਵਿੱਚ ਮਸੀਤਾਂ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਕੁਫਰ ਦੀਆਂ ਰੀਤਾਂ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਪਾਕਾਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਲੀਤਾਂ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਮੂਸਾ ਨਾ ਫਰੋਨ ਕੀ ਜਾਣਾ ਮੈਂ ਕੌਣ ਕੀ ਜਾਣਾ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੰਗਾ ਨਾ ਸ਼ਰਾਬਾ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਅੰਦਰ ਬੇਦਕਤਾਵਾ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਪੰਗਾ ਨਾ ਸ਼ਰਾਬਾ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਰਹਿੰਦਾ ਮਸਤ ਖਰਾਬਾ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਜਾਗਣ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਸੌ ਕੀ ਜਾਣਾ ਮੈਂ ਕੀ ਜਾਣਾ ਮਜ਼ਹਬ ਦਾ ਪਾਇਆ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਆਦਮ ਹਵਾ ਜਾਇਆ ਨਾ ਕੋਈ ਆਪਣਾ ਨਾਮ ਤਰਾਇਆ ਨਾ ਕੋਈ ਆਪਣਾ ਨਾਮ ਤਰਾਇਆ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਬੈਠਣ ਨਾ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਾਉਣ ਕੀ ਜਾਣਾ ਸ਼ਾਦੀ ਨਾ ਗਮ ਨਾ ਕੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਵਿੱਚ ਪਲੀ ਤੀ ਪਾਕੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਆ ਵੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਖਾਕੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਆ ਵੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਖਾਕੀ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ ਆਤਿਸ਼ ਨਾ ਮੈਂ
Thank you, Radhika, for that beautiful offering. And, you know, in that spirit of co-creating that deep space of oneness, I would like to invite Shay to uh, guide us into a small meditation uh, with the hope that we all can co-create a sacred field of the heart of oneness from the various nodes from various continents that we are all joining this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was so lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I actually thought I would start since we'll be speaking of the intelligence of the heart tonight. I wanted to read a brief passage and then lead us into a guided meditation. Um, the passage that I'm going to read comes from a book called Finding Refuge, and the author is Michelle Cassandra Johnson. And so it says, in the 1970s, Dr. J. Andrew Armour introduced the heart brain, positing the heart's intelligence as the flow of awareness, understanding, and intuition we experience when the mind and emotions are brought into coherent alignment with the heart. The heart brain can be activated through consistent self-initiated practice. The more we bring our awareness to how the heart is guiding us, the greater our ability to access our intuition. Since the time of Dr. Amour's research, the heart brain has been studied extensively. What has been uncovered is that the heart sends us emotional and intuitive signals that help govern our lives. The heart is in constant communication with the brain. The heart starts beating in an unborn fetus before the brain develops. The heart has its own extensive nervous system and the heart aligns many systems in the body so that they can function in harmony with one another. And so I wanted to take a moment as we begin to acknowledge the heart that lives within each one of us and allow ourselves just to dive in first to what your heart feels like right now. So for each and every one of us, just to take a moment, you can close your eyes or just kind of gently soften them and begin to feel inside your own body, inside your own being, what is the quality and intelligence of your heart right now? What does that feel like? And as we each begin to listen, begin to notice how that wisdom, that intelligence, that compassion inside of your own heart, how that extends beyond your individual self. How that wisdom, capacity, intelligence has an ability to extend even perhaps beyond space and time and allow all of us on different continents in different parts of the world to connect with one another in this conversation tonight and, and how together we have an opportunity to create a collective field, a collective intelligence of the heart. And so I would invite each of you that are listening and participating in this dialogue tonight to bring yourself fully, your intelligent heart fully into this field of consciousness that we're engaging in together so that the quality of our conversation can be elevated by your inner intelligence, the inner intelligence of your heart so that this talk will not simply be between Tracy and myself and Nipun, but it will actually be supported and carried by the intelligence of every heart that is participating in this call and any other wise hearts that want to weigh in. 
So I invite you to actively allow your presence to become a part of our conversation. And on that note, I will pass it back to Nipun. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Shay. Um, and thank you, Radhika, for that beautiful song and Shay for the wonderful meditation to reconnect with ourselves. Uh, I am, my name is Nipun. I'm uh, going to be, I get to be one of the moderator for this uh, incredible dialogue around the intelligence of the heart. Uh, with two people who sort of live it. If you're around them, I got to be around them uh, in January in person. Uh, they were both, in fact, roommates at a retreat uh, where we were together. Uh, and it was, uh, I, I think it's it's something that makes us all come alive. Um, and I'm, I'm very excited to see what unfolds, uh, not just during the call, but also after with, with everybody. Um, so I think most of you already know who Tracy and Shay are, uh, but doing my moderator duty, I'll say uh, just, a, just a few tidbits. Uh, Tracy is a neuroscientist uh, who has spent uh, almost two decades studying the brains of meditators, um, and we hope to learn a little bit more about um, how she got there. But I think I would say there are four big chunks of her life. Um, one is being the chief scientist, chief science officer at a think tank called Brain Mind. Um, she's also a consultant at Institute of Advanced Consciousness Studies. I mean, I didn't even know such institutes existed, but Advanced Consciousness Studies, I like that. Uh, and she is an uh, advisor at a venture fund of all things. Um, so it's a, that, but those are three things. The number four is uh, that she is a mom uh, of a two-year-old and I'm a mom of two soon. So on the way, and if we're lucky, we might get a cameo appearance of the two-year-old at <laughs> any point. You never know. It's going to be up to divine order. Highly likely. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome, Tracy. Thank you so much. Uh, um, and we also have Shay Bider with us. Uh, Shay is the founder of Integrative Touch, which has pioneered a very unique healing process, particularly for terminal uh, children. One of my favorite anecdotes, and I hope we get into this, is how she was on a boat in Alaska one time, and all of a sudden, 40 whales surrounded her, and she actually had a profound learning experience uh, through her interactions with those whales. Um, but here's a tidbit that you may not know about Shay. I did not until I I, I went to my AI assistants. Um, <laughs> I wonder what ChatGPT would say, you know, like, tell me something about Shay that nobody else knows. <laughs> um, but this could be one of those things. She's an avid uh, race car fan. So she loves racing. Um, and her 14 year old daughter, Ellie, it actually is a big baseball fan. So that's, uh, and she wants to be maybe a, a, a player as she grows up, but uh, maybe a coach even. So uh, welcome, Shay. It's a delight to have you uh, on the call here. Thank you. It's great to be with you. Fantastic. I, I want to start with uh, Tracy. Uh, and before, I know we're going to get into the mechanics of what a heart is beyond just a biological pump that, uh, you know, our textbooks tell us, or at least the old textbooks tell us. I think there's a lot of new science that tells us new stuff. But before we get into that, I just, it would be great to get a glimpse into each of your stories, but we'll start with you, Tracy, first. Um, where in your own personal journey uh, where did you uh, maybe first realize about the power uh, and the capacity and the hidden potential of love, of the human heart? Um, where would you cite that turning point for you? Oh, that's a hard question. <laughs> um, well, I mean, there's, there's a number of different ways that I, I feel like I could answer that question. Um, because there's been a, a number of points in my life where I think the power of love played a, a very pivotal role in, in kind of guiding me on my own path. Um, it certainly, I would say the, you know, I was 
I was blessed. I was um, I was taught by my grandparents at a young age to 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 meditate, uh, and that was a a really deep act of love and a gift that I think was incredibly pivotal pivotal for me in in terms of my own um, uh, like self capacity for self love and loving myself and being one with myself. Mm -hmm. Um, but then I would say, you know, I, I carried those practices with me for, for some time. And then it was, I would say the, a real pivotal, a really distinct pivotal moment in my life was when I was about to actually go to med school and I was working in a psychiatric facility for teenage women. And I, um, I realized that our our mental health care system had failed these these women, and that our kind of our current model of the way that we we viewed um, what wellness was, what self love, what love, is, wellness and love, and all these things, I find them very deeply interconnected. Um, you know that uh, these children didn't have the capacity, or these these young women had never really been taught self love. And, um, you know, and, and here they were, you know, on the brink of being incarcerated. And I actually started teaching some of them to meditate. And it was remarkable, the effect that that had on some of their lives. I, I, I received letters years later saying how even some just some basic, you know, really basic conceptual uh, teachings that I um kind of imparted upon them um it ended up really having an effect on their lives and so it was really those experiences that 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 actually shifted me from a, a medical path into doing neuroscience research on the effects of of mindfulness and meditation and compassion because I realized that until we had established the science showing how these things really change the brain we can change the brain through these practices change the way that we regulate our emotions and our own capacity for compassion for ourselves and for others and how deeply that's all intertwined um i i knew that that had to that groundwork had to be laid before um this would really be kind of something accepted at the societal level separate from its kind of religious um the religious piece so um so yeah, I would say that was that was probably a, a really distinct moment for me personally in my life. Well, that's great. We all read on the bios that like you had you you went into the Himalayas and studied meditating monks, and so I you know can you say a little bit about like a surprising moment like for most of us oh. who've not been deep into the Himalayas, let alone with like hardcore yogis, and then to yeah. like say, oh, can I put like, you know, these gadgets on <laughs> you, you know, so like you must have had, you must have had moments where you were like, wow, you know, different worldviews coming together, and yet like, you know, kind of a universality underneath, maybe. Uh, can you share like a moment that, uh, you know, that perhaps surprised you in your early years? Uh, Gosh, studying so many. Here? There were so I mean, living as a, as a young Western woman living in a monastery up in the Himalayas was definitely, you know, um, it, it was a blessing. And I, I, I was so lucky to, to have that opportunity. It was absolutely incredible. I mean, I, there were there were many moments that really uh impacted me I would say one of the first that really blew me away was I so in India when I was there it was I arrived in the in the summer and it was so hot so we ended up doing all of our EEG recordings really late at night actually like after 10 p.m so I'd be up all night working with these monks and collecting um you know data on all these different experimental tasks and paradigms that that I was running and I remember we went in with Swami Veda, who was the, um, you know, the, the head of the ashram where I, I lived for years. And he was a very gifted meditator. And he, we put the EEG on his, on his, uh, on his head one night, and he actually flatlined the EEG, which is, he made his brain look, it just looked like he was he wasn't, it looked like, I mean, he flatlined the, the EG. It's actually very low Delta. So, so actually what that translates to scientifically is not like a dead brain, but, but just visually the capacity for someone to so significantly modulate their brain on demand was just 
it just blew any question in my mind around like what we're capable of doing. I mean, if any doctor would look at that and your standard, you know, you look at that AG and you think, wow, like something's crazy. And then he could just, he could really modulate his, his brain states on demand. And it was very visible, which is normally something that you have to do all kinds of analysis in order to, to understand what's changing. But this was like a very a, a visual change that was just blew me away. Um, yeah. That's, so, that's beautiful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And and maybe also just his capacity to affect people around him. You know, I we can speak a little bit about it. Shay actually beautifully kind of summarized my whole talk in that one little passage. <laughs> Thank you, Shay. But um uh you know, I think you when you're in the presence of of a truly great master, there's there's just something that happens um to you and to the people around you and I think um being around Swami Veda was was just a, an incredibly profound lesson in and of itself because just being in the presence of someone um who who made you feel seen completely seen if not naked but also deeply connected to this um field much greater than ourselves as a neuroscientist it was very uh, challenging for me over the years because a lot of my deep fundamental scientific indoctrination was just being challenged constantly with these ideas that actually now are kind of catching up some of our science is catching up and we're starting to understand and I'll speak to that a little bit uh uh in a minute here about how how the heart actually is a field that that emits off the body and and it's something that we uh now can measure and understand that it's it's actually interacting with other people but around before us. Before we get into that, I, I, I want to, we'll, we'll come back to that for sure, because yeah. we want to dive into uh, the new neuroscience of, of the mm -hmm. heart. But I want to, uh, I want to introduce Shay also with her uh, journey, Shay. Uh, what, uh, what would you say, uh, you know, as you, you've had a, diff a different journey, but in so many ways, a similar journey to land into the heart of love uh what would you say was uh you know a turning point maybe a pivotal experience um that just expanded your heart yeah i think nipun um when i heard you ask this question the first thing that came to me immediately is actually the stories of the parents that i've worked with through integrative touch in the hospital and what i have seen their hearts do for their children. And so I want to share just a few brief examples of that, because that showed me more than anything, probably in my life, you know, the capacity of the heart. So I remember I walked into a hospital room one day and there was a father there and I could see he was in physical pain. I didn't know what was happening, but I saw his body was in pain. His daughter was also in the hospital bed in quite a bit of pain herself. And the two of them were there together. And there was like a very loving quality and energy between the two of them. But there was also tremendous pain present. And as I got to like engage and uh, learn about each of them, I discovered that the daughter had a very serious kidney disease and had needed a kidney transplant. And her father had just given her one of his kidneys. And he was in recovery from that surgery sitting next to his daughter. And there was something in honestly the nonverbals of that moment, like none of it was actually being communicated in words, but it was a felt experience of just pure love. You know, how he had literally given a part of his body for his daughter to help save her life. And I thought, my goodness, if that isn't the capacity of love, like I don't know what is. <laughs> Um, and I, it's crazy. I have, I have an unbelievable number of stories like that. That's what's so stunning to me is, um, you know, the ability of one human being to give so completely of themselves for another. There's another mom I will never, ever, ever forget. So we worked for a while in a palliative care clinic with a lot of children who were at end of life and in very severe pain in many cases, trying to manage that pain and help them. And this one mother came in and her child at that point was probably about maybe seven years of age. And 
that mother at one point in our work together shared with me that in those seven years that her daughter had been alive, that mother had never been able to sleep for more than two hours at a time because she had to get up every two hours and you know do things with her breathing tube and her all just different medical equipment that her daughter required to stay alive. The mother had to attend to that every couple of hours. So she had not had more than a couple hours sleep at a time in all of those years. And when I grasped this and I saw her level of stress was just like beyond enormous, as you would imagine what that would do to a human being. Um, but again, there was something in the level of like heart commitment that was fierce. And I guess that's also a piece I want to touch on in our communication around the heart is there is this element that I have witnessed, and certainly you see it with parents and children who are seriously ill, that a loving heart can also be fierce, like it can show up in the most difficult of circumstances. So some of the families have certainly taught me a great deal about that capacity. Wow, that's, that's beautiful. I, I feel like I want to get into the fierce part right away, <laughs> um, but, but we, we will get there. Uh, because it's it's true, I think, like you were saying, that all too often we kind of think of love as, oh, there's, you know, this Hollywood version or Bollywood version if you're in India. Um, but actually, it's way beyond that. I mean, it's in, it includes that, but there's actually so much more, so many other places that love can go and has gone, um, it, even if we weren't that we weren't aware of how it was changing history. Uh, maybe, maybe Tracy, we go, we go to you and uh, before we dive further into uh, Shay's insights around this. But as a neuroscientist, you know, like what is if if somebody tells you, well, explain the heart's capacities to us, especially with new science. Uh, yeah. You know, maybe in the last 10, 15 years that has illuminated it, you know, that it's it's there's actually a neural activity just as you have in the brain. So there's yeah. something there must be something like you work at the Brain Mind Institute. But there could be a Heart Mind <laughs> Institute, too, you know. Well, there's um, actually a Heart Math Institute, which which has done some really incredible work in this space. Um, I know a few of the people um, there and and their work has been really groundbreaking because they they really study explicitly this really this bi-directional relationship as Jay was mentioning there is this bi-directional relationship going on between the heart and the brain I mean and to your point uh, the brain has a hundred billion neurons but we recently discovered that the heart actually has hundreds of thousands of neurons itself and operates as an, it, it operates bi-directionally. So it's interacting with the brain, but it also operates independently. So it can make decisions based on the external and internal environment of the body. So, so they call it the mini brain um, because it does have its own kind of operational capacity, which is something that was not fully understood until recently. It also produces the largest electromagnetic field in the, in the human body. So, you know, we have all this fancy equipment to measure EEG and we put it up close, but actually the heart emits a field that's detectable several feet off of the body using certain types of equipment. And HeartMath, this institute has done some pretty incredible research showing that they can actually pick up, um, well, so two parts. One, they can pick up this heart, your heart, um, they call it coherence. So the coherence of the field, which is actually a a combination of your, your respiration and your heart rate, but this coherence is influenced by your emotional state. So if you're in a state of love or compassion, there's actually greater coherence in the field of your heart, this electromagnetic field that radiates off the body. And the second part of that research, which I found super fascinating, is they can actually detect that field in other people that are in close proximity. If you look at someone's EEG, you can find the person who's in proximity to them. You can find their heart rate measured in the EEG using um, sophisticated measure. And, and if you're actually physically touching them, it's, it's very significant, but they actually found that even just being in physical proximity, um, they were able to detect um, the other individual's heart. So I think this speaks a lot to, you know, perhaps some of the work that Shay does 
and other people that work in these healing modalities where this, you know, we've, we've struggled to identify mechanisms of healing modalities and energy and like, what is this energy? And I think we're, the science is now starting to show that these fields, you know, we measure them here. So they're obviously coming off the body. It's just, it's really in our measurement and our technical skill skills and our, um, you know, our hardware that, that, that is the, the limit, what limits us in our ability to study these uh, phenomena. Um, just to just a clarifying yeah. comment, you for those of uh, for those of us who are not uh, neuroscientists or yeah. don't know what EEG is, I mean, I oh, from, what you, were, yeah. from what you were sharing, yeah. uh, it, what you were saying is that even if we aren't in physical contact, my brain is actually registering your heartbeat. Yes. Yeah, yeah, the so so EEG, actually, yeah, yeah, measures the electrical fields that are generated by populations of neurons in the brain. And so when you're measuring EEG, you're measuring populations of neurons that are firing together in various parts of the brain. And that's what's registered in an EEG. Generally, it's all over the, the head. Um, and so, yes, in that in that signal, you can pick up um, these the the heart electromagnetic field, which is and the electromagnetic field is just generated from the heart, the cells uh, pumping from the muscles contracting. Wow. Um, and, and so the more the more in coherence I am or the more connected I am to the heart, the wider the field of resonance. Is that well, is that an so accurate statement? No, I, I mean the field in and of itself is 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 the strongest field in the human body, but the coherence in that field, which is something that they use, like I said, it's a, me a metric that shows the relationship between your body. So your whole physiological body, your your breathing and your heart are in sync when you're also when your emotions are, when you're in a positive mm -hmm. state of love and compassion. And that coherence could potentially be influencing other people. So we know that the electromagnetic field of the heart um, is also interacting with the electromagnetic fields of organs in the body, and that this interaction actually regulates digestion, it influences blood pressure, and it even influences immune function. And so in this conversation leading up to today's talk, you know, all these different ideas we were talking about, and Shay mentioned, oh, you know, my heart, I feel like when um, my, I'm becoming sick, I can feel it in my heart or vice versa. And, and actually there's, there's an abundance of evidence to show that, that these electromagnetic fields actually interact and influence, um, immunity. So this really speaks to this bi-directional relationship too, with our emotions and the heart. And to Che's point, you know, there's a structure in the brain called the insula. And this is a part of the brain that's directly involved in compassion. It's actually the one part of the brain when you study thousands of different meditators that have practiced all different traditions. The one part of the brain that is universally targeted by meditation is the insula, the anterior insula. And it just so happens that the anterior insula is the part of the brain that's directly involved in the generation of compassion. It's also directly involved in the regulation of the brain and the heart and the heart and interoceptive. So your, your, your capacity to be aware of what's happening in the body, in the brain, is in the insula, which is directly connected to the heart. So there, there are these interacting um, kind of relationships that seem to be, they're, they're bi-directional and they're very much influenced by your emotional state. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm very curious now to know if we can actually change these things and expand and all of that. But before we get there, Shay, any responses of uh, because you've been doing this work not with uh, neuroscience per se, but actually in live fields where you do, even without physical touch. I mean, your whole effort is called integrative touch, right? Um, and I've heard you say that it's not necessary. It's not necessarily physical touch, even. Right. And so, how how does this land in terms of your concrete experience? Yeah, I think. Um, one of the positive hacks, so to speak, that we discovered in our healing work is that if you create a field, so a collective field of people, right? So instead of having one person on a healing team, you have multiple, and that could be three or four or five or more, um, that you can actually create this coherence that Tracy's talking about, right? So you get all of those healing arts practitioners aligned and themselves in a coherent state. 
And now you're creating a coherent field together in a unified fashion. And then when you bring into that field, someone who is seriously ill or struggling is in fear or trauma or illness, their system, just like Tracy was identifying, you can actually see it with some of our tools for measurement. Um, their system will actually start to sort of rise to the occasion is how I would describe it. It will begin to pattern itself. Maybe even Tracy and I've talked about entrain itself, perhaps there's something going on there, right? Where the intelligent system of those beings uh, around that person who maybe is experiencing illness or trauma, it's starting to help their system, which is maybe in a more compromised state in that moment to resource essentially, mm -hmm. to resource. And so this is very important for profound healing work. You know, we've done this with people. I think the, the a place where I saw the greatest need for it was we worked with patients in a mental institution, very similar to what Tracy was describing early on in, in response to one of your questions, Nipun. And there I needed a whole team to hold a very strong coherent state to help that person who had strong mental disturbance to begin to regulate and to begin to sort of in themselves find that intelligence that does know how to heal, that is inherently in each one of us. And so by creating a particular coherent state, we can actually support another human in finding that in themselves. And that, that to me is like, oh, it's a lovely, it's a lovely way to support healing. Yeah, I mean, to to me, I I I don't have the kind of science uh, or even the hands-on experience that Shay has, or the science that Tracy's talking about. But I remember uh, being with horses, and one of my one of our community members actually trains other horse whisperers, so she's quite an expert in this field. And she said something that's just been universally true for about horses all the time is that they would travel in packs. And if one of the horses, like their heartbeat was not aligned, that would actually be the weakest link. And so for them to survive, they would all help that one horse align its heart rate. Uh, or I mean, I don't know if heart rate is the right technical word, but what they then said is that even if a horse is in a stable, just doing its own thing, and I go in within a hundred feet um, and I am having, let's say, I'm I, I'm disturbed or I'm not in coherence. The horse automatically starts to help me. Uh, and then they went out and they've done this research that if you are, uh, say, you're on the autism spectrum, you just go sit on a horse and there's nothing to do, and invariably you come back feeling uh, much more aligned. And there's a lot of data around this. So this is not like out there sort of like, you know, in the Himalayas. I mean, I think it's always been every, I mean, this is our nature, but maybe it's, you know, I think it took us 5,000 years to figure out that, you know, putting wheels on bags is a good idea. Like maybe this is one of those things where it's like, oh guys, you know, like we're as strong as the weakest one of us and it's in all our interests to start aligning, right? Like, so I think we want to believe in this, um, but you, Tracy, uh, how, how do you, uh, wh what is your uh, sense of how we can, um, you know, how, I, how, how do we believe in this story even more? <laughs> because you have a lot of uh, data and research. Um, yeah, there's, I mean, there is a lot of research now. It's, it's, it's pretty phenomenal, actually. I, I, I was recently looking at a, a, a plot showing the number of publications on the scientific neuroscientific study of meditation, and, and it's an exponential curve. Like this year, it was just through the roof. So um, everything I talk about or have mentioned, I'm happy to share like a PDF that has links to all of the articles that reference any of the the science that we that we talk about tonight for anyone in the audience that's um that's interested but um yeah i mean i would say like back to your your question about like how how do we how do we really bring home like the the connection between like the science and what we understand and 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 communicate that in ways that that is effective and lands and 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 transforms society i mean that's something I, you know, I, I actively work on. That's my life's work, right? It's it's really been um, hard because, you know, we kind of have to 
commercialize on some level um, these practices in order to make them scalable. But but I think one of the key things that we've been missing right now in, in, in our work to translate, like there's mindfulness apps, you have Calm and Headspace and all of these apps. And, and there are people really doing a lot of work trying to bring these practices to people to transform society. Um, but actually, I think one of the things that we've been missing the most is, is community and the role of community. And this ties in really nicely to Shay's point about like the coherence of the collective and like the force of, of being in the presence of other people and how that there's like a unifying, like a biological, I'm actually in the process of writing a large grant to study this, but like, what is the effect of being in a group and that on this coherence and on this entrainment, like, do we really entrain other people on a bio neurophysiological level um, through, you know, engaging in these practices together I mean, I think anyone that was at the Gandhi 3.0 retreat or probably any of your other activities, you you live this, you feel it, you know it. It's it's very obvious um, experientially. Uh, but the method the methods behind studying that are are tricky and, and complex. And so I think um, in terms of the science, we're getting there. But I think one bit of science that speaks specifically to this point is kind of back to this notion that these practices affect. Um, the insula. Uh, there's also other parts of the brain, including the interior cingulate cortex and the medial prefrontal cortex. There's a number of different parts of the brain that um, seem to be explicitly targeted that are involved in, in thinking about oneself. And they've shown that as you meditate, um, who you include in your in-group actually expands. So we have this tendency to, there's this, there's us, and then there's the other. And that's really at the root of fear. And I think at the root of a lot of conflict in the world really is, you know, we perceive there's ourselves and then there's the other. And we have kind of evolved to actually have this, we call it the fight or flight, but the amygdala, when, when we perceive someone as different from ourselves, there's a part of our brain that actually is involved in conflict detection uh, that, that lights up. And we sit there and we kind of evaluate that that person uh, as though they were separate from ourselves and a potential threat. We have like a, a stress response in the body. And we've shown that these compassion practices, mindfulness practices, they actually reduce activation in the amygdala when viewing pictures in an experimental condition, when viewing pictures of people from out groups. And so it actually is fundamentally rewiring your brain to expand your sense of self to include people who are different from yourself. And so I think, I think how these practices will end up transforming society is just, is just through this continual ripple effect of everyone, like everyone here on this call, you know, coming together in this communal effect that really amplifies some of these neurophysiological mechanisms that I'm talking about. Um, I mean, I think that's that's a big part of it. And I, I just think that's so interesting because most everybody who talks about meditation and spiritual cultivation mm. these days thinks about it as an individual pursuit, right? Like, and you have all these self-help books saying, hey, yeah. if, if this is not right, do this and fix it. But that puts the whole onus on our willpower. And so many things are beyond the threshold of individual willpower. But if we discover not just community as like a group of people coming together, but this deep kind of coherence um, that perhaps even transcends, uh, a, you know, explicit material form, then I think we might be able to tap into a deeper resource uh, for our own cultivation, you know, so I think there's something there that feels like a new pattern. Um, and we see this in nature, right? You see the murmurations and you see uh, fireflies, you know, doing their bit. Um, so I, I, I want to explore that. But before that, I, I want to go back to a point that Shay had brought up around fierce compassion, because I think it relates, Tracy, to this point of other, right? Like, and and how do we get past that? And I think love has a way to do that. Heart has a way to do that. And I think our entire body is wired in a way that it wants that, right? But we tend to have a lot of noise before we can get to that signal. Um, so Shay, I want to ask you that. And I also want to bring in Gandhi because I, there's this quote about Gandhi, which I have always been fascinated by, um, you know, and, and Gandhi being somebody who we would think of as someone who did external work in the world of, uh, of social change. But he says, 
you know, just as a scientist will work wonders out of various applications of the laws of nature, uh, a person who applies the laws of love with scientific precision can work even greater wonders. Right? Nonviolence is infinitely more wonderful and subtle than even forces like electricity. So the law of love is a far greater science than any modern science. Now he's saying this 50 years ago, and now science has made a lot of progress. Um, but I think there's something there, and it, but it feels like it needs to show up in a gentle way and in maybe even gentler way uh, that is actually radically fierce. Uh, because we're used to like this othering kind of fears, but I think there's a different kind of fears that perhaps you're talking about. So Shay, maybe you can reflect a little bit on what fierce love looks like uh, and how it has showed up in your work. Um, and also before you do, I, I forgot I have to make my announcement. Um, if anybody wants has a question, um, you can, uh, if you're on the Zoom call, you can relay it to the Zoom host. Uh, if you're on the live stream, you can um, you can click on add or ask a question, um, and we'd love to. Uh, and and there you can also email us. There's a thousand ways to get in touch. Um, but yes, uh, we would love to have your inquiries also as a as a part of the process. We'll have time for that in a little bit. But Shay, over to you for uh, fierce love. Yeah. My sense is that idea of fierce love comes through relationship, right? Like those stories that I shared about, you know, the parent caring for their child. It's like, this is relational love, right? This fierce love is born out of human relationship. And a piece that I wanted to share in our conversation tonight that I think is very important to an understanding of just who we are and how we love is that all of this starts very early on. So um, it begins in literally the way we're born into the world. So I'm going to read a, a passage from a book called A General Theory of Love. Um, and so they write, because human physiology is at least in part an open loop arrangement, an individual does not direct all of his own functions. A second person transmits regulatory information that can alter hormone levels, cardiovascular function, sleep rhythms, immune function, and more inside the body of the first. The reciprocal process occurs simultaneously. The first person regulates the physiology of the second, even as he himself is regulated. Neither is a functioning whole on his own. Each has open loops that only somebody else can complete. Together, they create a stable, properly balanced pair of organisms, and the two trade their complementary data through the open channel their limbic connection provides. And I love that, you know, that's how we're born into the world is in that relational context and that that fierce love, I mean, you know, in my own experience, I do feel like I've sometimes seen a parent, you know, probably keep a child alive longer than they otherwise would have survived if they didn't have that open loop connection where that one system was helping to support that other system. And so there is some element of love in that relational understanding of it where we're actually transmitting information from one system to another that is helping that system to thrive. And I wanted to share, Nipun, because you made me think about this because I know you like the stories about um, animals and how all of this is like across species, right? So I want to go back to horses really quick. Um, so, because I think, you know, from my story of the whales, we have the capacity to transmit this communication and maybe it is stemming from that electromagnetic magnetic field in the heart, but from species to species. And I'll give you just like a really quick share on that. Um, I had an opportunity to work with a woman who was a very renowned equine therapist who you would get to work with a horse, but as a teacher, the horse was your teacher. And so I got to work with this woman and a horse who had been very deeply traumatized. And because this horse had been very deeply traumatized in this big field, this big grassy field that was probably about the size of a football field. 
there was only one place in which you could stand where the person could stand and the horse would feel safe because everywhere else on that field, this gigantic field for a reason that we can't even maybe totally logically understand, that horse felt some level of distress. But if you landed in this one spot, the horse would calm and exhibit the signs that a horse will show when they're relaxed. So at one of the, I didn't know this, but one of the exercises this woman would do to see how you're able to communicate with the horse and, and sort of listen, is she would tell you to try to find, you know, get anywhere close to that spot on the field. And so because I've worked so much with trauma for my entire life, and one of the first things you learn about trauma is you have to establish safety. You must establish safety in order to allow a person to heal from a trauma response. So I used every piece of intelligence in my body to try to listen so deeply to that horse's nonverbal communication of where on this field do you feel safe? And I observed the horse and I moved my body and I walked exactly into the one spot where the horse relaxed. And the woman said to me afterwards, she said, who told you? And I said, um, what do you mean who told me? She said, oh, somebody must have told you. No one can ever find like the exact spot. And the answer I wanted to give her was the horse told me. The horse told me, right? Like this is again, this is a form of the heart's intelligence. When we listen using those fields, I didn't do anything other than listen to the horse, right? That was all that I did. I was just listening to the horse. And so I do think, you know, these capacities, they do extend, you know, across species. So, <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> um, no, that's, that's beautiful. Uh, I, I, I'm thinking of various stories. We have uh, there many people who are animal communicators in this community. Uh, and it just, I mean, it, it just kind of gives you goosebumps when you realize, man, and, and not just animals, you can say even trees, right? All life. Um, Tracy, you've done research on this notion of othering. I mean, we can talk about anecdotes and possibilities of, of, uh, these beautiful things coming together, all life coming together. And yet we are at some point, we start getting into that part of our brain where we have this sense of other, that this is not like me. You've actually done research yourself on how that capacity uh, to other and to feel like, oh, this is mine, can change, is adaptable, is malleable, is something we can work on. Is that, can you share a little bit on, on that? Because I found that to be fascinating. Yeah, I mean, it's essentially kind of that, what you just said in a nutshell. Essentially, we found that as, as meditation practitioners, um, you know, we had them on a spectrum of experience. And so as our meditators became more and more experienced, the less their brains othered others. <laughs> Literally, like I said, their, their sense of self actually begins to, or their perceived, their cognitive self, should I say, in, in the brain and in terms of the way that we look at, um, you know, we can put a, a, put, put a person in an MRI scanner and have them think about themselves. And there are very distinct neural correlates of what that looks like and then you have them think about an other person and those are very different correlates uh, there are some overlapping uh, structures and features to that activity but there are they are different and that as people meditate uh, that activity changes so so I absolutely this is this is you know I mean this is kind of about this isn't so much speaking to neuroplasticity, right? Because that's really more about changing the physical structures of the brain. And there may be a piece of neuroplasticity involved in that, but this is really about a reconceptualization, a reframing of, 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 um, of, of our sense of connectedness with other people. And I think that when you engage in these practices and you become sensitive, it's like, I want to say that what everything that Shay just talked about, I think it's because it has a lot to do with trust, trusting yourself 
and trusting your relationship with other people. And I would argue that there's also like a, you know, there's an electromagnetic field that is like physically picked up. It's not just in body language and there's all kinds of cues, but it's also potentially in these fields that people can be sensitive to. And Shay, I think is uniquely sensitive. And I think that as people meditate over time, you actually become physiologically sensitive to uh, the fields and the rhythms around you and the people around you. And um, I do think there's an interaction going on. And so I, one of the questions I have, you know, that I'm exploring right now in my own research is the role of trust in mm. this capacity to entrain bio neurophysiological signals in other people. Like, is there a way that we can influence um, receptibility through creating environments of trust? Um, and does an individual, a teacher, for example, do some teachers really engender a feeling of trust? And is that a big part of like the healing process or the receptivity of a, of a student? And, and how, how do we use um, our understanding of that to, to kind of amplify uh, this work? Yeah, well, bringing some of these things together, and this is an open question for both of you. We have a whole bunch of questions, and I, I'm, I, I won't go to a specific one, but I think there's a lot of them that are pointing to this uh, notion that, look, it's hard to be in that state of unconditional love with all people at all times, and with some people, especially so. So if I'm in one of these adversarial kinds of spaces, I am even mindful that I don't want to be in this space in me. I even maybe believe that this is changeable. This is a state that's not permanent that I can actually go beyond this what would you guys say like how do you what is that fierce love to build that bridge how do you make sure you don't bite off more than you can chew because then you burn out and so there's place for skillful tender boundaries also at points um, and maybe there's some science-backed uh, you know sorts of uh, practices uh, that we can do so maybe we go to Shay first and then Tracy after that because I think it's a very con it's it's a very you know, it's, it's a very tangible thing, uh, you know, for people to say that, yeah, I, I want to, I want, I feel like, okay, I've got this much open heart, it can go here, I want to practice it. Um, but then there's all these things in between uh, that seem to come in the way. So what would you say to that, Shay and, and Tracy? Yeah, I guess my initial response would be, first of all, no one's perfect. So whew, let that go, right? <laughs> We're all gonna... <laughs> fall off the bandwagon, so to speak, at times and not be our best self. So let's just be a fine with that. Let's start there. <laughs> um, but I actually do think there are, you know, Tracy's, a large part of Tracy's career is studying meditation. Meditation is a practice, right? There are practices, there are trainings, there are things we can do that teach us how to elevate our system in very practical, tangible ways. And a simple one I would give to the listeners here. Um, I mentioned to you, Nipun, I recently interviewed Michael Amster, who's the co-author of the book, The Power of Awe. And they've done a lot of fascinating research, some of it out of the Greater Good Science Center at UC Berkeley, around how this simple practice of immersing yourself in a state of awe uh, and in their particular design, they usually do it three times a day. It only takes about 15 seconds. So we're talking about less than a minute a day. You're, they have a very simple technique. It's capital A, capital W, capital E, awe technique or method, they call it. Uh, you can look it up to learn the steps. And you simply immerse yourself in this state of awe. And by doing that, there are beautiful benefits in terms of positive affect, a whole range of health outcomes that seem to, you know, shift quite quickly, actually. And so, you know, for people that are listening that are like, oh, my gosh, I'm not always in a state of unconditional love. It's like, well, OK, none of us are. <laughs> let's <laughs> let's be real. Um, and remember that actually we have great power and choice about how we can use some of these tools and practices, some that are newer. This one is kind of a, an interesting spin, um, but many that are very ancient. And so we have an ability when we're totally out of sorts to draw and resource on some of these practices to regain 
a place of connection and centeredness. So that would be my initial thought. Yeah, that's beautiful. Oh, I'll totally uh, just Tra iterate. Tracy, I'll yeah. Iterate, yeah, I'll iterate on that, Shay. I, I, I totally agree, especially with your initial point about, um, you know, we're, we're never perfect. And, and I think that kind of ties into kind of some of the original insights that brought me into this work in general, which was just the power of these practices for self-compassion. Because to me, self is really comes back to self-compassion because we we beat ourselves up so much. That's the, one of the first things I realized when I really started intensely meditating was I was just constantly beating myself up in my own mind. And then, you know, when you're doing that to yourself, you know, you kind of tend to do that to other people too, on some level. I mean, we're all different, but I think self-compassion and, and, and so to the meditation piece, you know, what can we do? And I think a lot of, especially in the West, we've focused a lot on these attention training practices because we want to get control of our lives and control our minds, but we don't have control of our minds. And the goal of meditation is not to control anything. The, the, the point is to become aware it's the awareness that is that is key. And when you can become aware of when you're mind wandering or when you're thinking or when you're ruminating, you are empowered. You're in a position of empowerment where you can choose to be present. You can choose to have compassion. And I'll just say that, you know, a lot of these practices, this attention training and focused attention and concentration and optimization, this is a very like Western commodified interpretation of a lot of these practices. But I think one of the things that we really missed on, missed the mark on, and I know a lot of work is being done at the Mind and Life Institute and other places where there's a strong emphasis on these compassion practices, because it does seem to be where there's a lot of transformational capacity and a lot of um, where healing and trauma and all of these things, those are the practices that seem to be uniquely transformational for people in their, in the, in the heart space, right. In their capacity to, to change the way that they react in those moments when they, Oh, like, ah, uh, you know, they, they other people or they, you know, they really are challenged. I think when you have those tools in your toolkit, like Shay said, you know, this, this, we're not, we're not perfect. It's never, it's never going to be, you know, these things are natural, but your ability to say, okay, like I'm compassionate with myself for having that reaction, maybe take a step back and then maybe have a more compassionate approach to, to that person in that moment, or even later come back and say, Hey, like, you know, I was whatever. I think these types of tools are, can be incredibly powerful and transformational. Yeah. Um, it, so if I'm understanding uh, what both of you are saying is that you have to be gentle with yourself, uh, you want to practice self-compassion, there's many of those practices, then you go out and, and practice it with others where it feels safe, um, and at some point you build like this inner capacity where your threshold goes up and you start to do it with people who you think are others or are difficult and you start sharing in that way and your circle widens. Um, and as you go through that process, then I think what we alluded to, but we didn't dive into, and I would love to get both of your thoughts on it, is I, is this collective coherence that seems to happen. We've all, I mean, I know it anecdotally. I mean, you can say anecdotally, but like hundreds of times, you know, sitting in these circles, uh, you know, sometimes you're just in a circle. It doesn't even have to be a big circle. And all of a sudden you find yourself saying things and it, it, it in a way that it surprises you. And you're like, oh, what is that? Or you're like, Tracy, you mentioned being in the presence of a saintly person. Somehow it's like a tuning fork that just somehow aligns uh, sort of like what a horse probably does, but maybe in a different way. Um, and, and so what is this collective uh, coherence? Uh, what is this emergence? I, I like to use the word emergence, uh, but a bunch of folks have... Uh, also asked about, well, I've seen a lot of brain studies about individual meditation. Um, this is Susan Clark saying, uh, does Tracy know of studies about this collective coherence? Uh, but also to expand that beyond studies to say, you know, Shay's been doing this uh, by bedsides of so many patients for so long. Like, how do we go in and say, I want to ignite, let's say I want to ignite collective coherence. I want to ignite a field which is greater than the sum of the parts that are there. Um, what seem to be, uh, even if it's not conclusive, what is your intuition around what seem to be the key ingredients 
for building such a collective field from both of your unique lenses? Whoever wants to go first. Uh, Shay, go ahead. Okay. Well, mine will be more of a emerging answer, internal, very organic, very like, because <laughs> I'm going to tell you how it feels. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to tell you my, my internal felt experience of this. So how I feel it arise in a, in a group is that first, there is a point of inception within the heart of an individual who's part of this coherent collective field. And in my own being, I feel it as a rising of compassion in my own heart that is so strong, such a love, you know, such a love wants to arise to support someone in their healing process that my own heart just lifts up to, to want to meet them just out of pure compassion. And then in that rising, and intelligence within my system that's in everyone's system and no different from everybody else. There is this listening, right? So we have our multi-sensory beings that we are, where we can begin to tap into all of the sensory information that is around us and then the interception, like what is within us. And so for me, the inception point is actually love and compassion itself that then allows my being to become more fully multi-sensory, multi-dimensional. And, you know, from that space, then there's an inherent capacity to really internalize the suffering of another and identify with what is most needed for them to find a place of stillness, love and joy and peace within. And so uh, for me, all, all these abilities, you know, whatever we call them, these extrasensory abilities that we all have the capacity to touch, they, they actually stem themselves from a deep heart of compassion that just sort of like blasts itself open and wants so much to love and to help and to support another that it sort of expands our field beyond what we might think of as our ordinary day-to-day -day potential into something that feels a little extraordinary. But again, I don't think it's a unique capacity. I feel very strongly it's something that, you know, all of us can do fundamentally. Every shade to just have a quick follow up question to that. This is building on Terry Sandler's question, but uh, you know, you knowing you and all your stories and anecdotes and your you know real life presence as well. You're an empath. You've uh, you you. I, I don't know if empath is the right word. I like to use the word mystic, but you know you have this sense of a collective field. You it's a very physical, real experience for you. And when you do that, um, and I, I know many people who are able to do that, they talk also about the challenges of like just sitting on a plane and if all your channels are open, all of a sudden it can be very overwhelming. Um, so at, at some point we talk about expanding our channels. Uh, what Howard Thurman in fact told uh, Martin Luther King Jr. to deepen his channels at the age of 29, um, because he says, otherwise the movement's just gonna eat you up. So there's something to that. And then there's something to figuring out how to manage that. I, I, don't, I don't know what the right word for that is even, but what advice would you have for empaths out there who are, um, who are you know, maybe early in the process of learning to hold a lot more than just their own stuff? Yes, I can give a very practical answer to that. When I first started doing healing work, I was a mess. I literally took everyone's everything inside my system. And I was like, oh, I am not going to survive this for like <laughs> another minute if I don't figure something out. And so I, I trained myself. I literally trained myself how to set emotional and energetic boundaries so much so that now I can go into like, the darkest place of suffering where someone is essentially in hell and I can meet them there without getting like engrossed in it to the degree to which I can no longer be of service. But that truthfully was a training and I was terrible at it at first. It was just absolutely terrible. I just took everything on. It was like a silly sponge. And then it was actually, again, out of a, a desire to be able to do the work that I, I developed I develop practices for myself to begin to set very healthy boundaries. The only place I'm still terrible at it 
is in the water. In the water, I cannot hold a boundary. So that thus the connection to whales and dolphins and <laughs> in the water, I am very vulnerable. <laughs> <laughs> Well, most of us feel vulnerable on just in air. So, uh, you know, this is, this is good that you've got air covered. Uh, you're working well, on water. Well, at least to some, to some degree. I'm not, nothing's perfect here. <laughs> uh, Tracy, any, any responses on the collective coherence bit and even, uh, e even the skillful uh, boundary setting while working with collective coherence in, you know, wh whichever, however you want to respond to it? Yeah. I mean, I'll just speak a, a bit to Shay's point about, you know, what I've been studying is a practice and, and that mindfulness and com these compassion practices are practices. So it's it's definitely a skill, the, the mind and the brain, so to speak. If you just like doing reps, you know, the brain responds similarly. So if you do something over and over again, you do fundamentally alter the structure and, um, you know, of, of parts of the brain. Uh, so to the neuroplastic piece, uh, we are capable of rewiring our brains and training. And so to Shay's point, this is something that you, you really tr tr can train. It doesn't just instantaneously come. And so um, I think that's that speaks to one point to the collective piece and to the question that um, the woman asked about, um, you know, why we don't have so many studies on the uh, this collective emergence and the coherence piece. Um, it's very difficult to study EEG activity in large groups of people in terms of time locking the actual physical data from one person to another um, is methodologically just very challenging. That's actually a, a large research project that it's, it's part of the original um, project I mentioned about trust and, and, and entrainment. That's actually going to be, uh, it's called hyperscanning. It's a large a uh, group study where we'll be measuring um, electrophysiological data, so both brain data and physiological data um, uh, in real time across a large group of people in the presence of, you know, these um, uh, powerful teachers to study um, how, whether or not there's a level of entrainment that takes place. Um, mm -hmm. And then also the, the effect of the group cohesion and, and, and whether or not there's entrainment within individuals and whether that functions as a vary of numbers. So we'll study small groups and then progressively get, get larger and larger to try and get some kind of a basic understanding because the, the work hasn't been done because just methodologically it's very challenging. Uh, but uh, with advances in technology and hardware and wearable EEG systems and things like that, it's, it's becoming more feasible. Yeah, well, that's great. Sister Marilyn uh, Lacey, whom both of you also know, uh, is listening in, and she had a very interesting question building on that. Uh, she says, what about a fiercely negative uh, uh, emotion? Or what about the fiercely negative emotions, like a demagogue fomenting a, a riot in a crowd? Does that sort of flow of hatred also occur as collective incoherence that spreads from heart to heart? Um, and I would add to that, that like how, I mean, I would imagine you might say yes, and if you would, like, how is that different from the flow of coherence? I mean, how, how would you hold both of these uh, together? I mean, my, my initial, um, I mean, based on the, the limited research that is out there, there was a relationship in coherence with love. So as your body is in this state of relaxation and love, there is a synchronization between your heart and your breathing. And that physiological process in and of itself is what facilitates an increase in magnitude of the electromagnetic field, right? And so then theoretically, and don't, you know, this is an interpretation. This is my interpretation of the data, Theoretically, one could argue that the power of love is then more powerful than an incoherent state, because if you're in an incoherent state where you're not relaxed, you don't have that physiological synchronization, or at least that's not been studied. Um, and therefore, you know, um, I, I don't know how that would interact with the field. I, I'm not familiar with the research, but I would tend to argue that the power of love 
is more significant than the power of how, just based on some of those findings in general. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and and it's not just love and hatred as a binary because there's a whole complex array of emotions. You know, you could, I'd imagine, a bunch of uh, bankers on Wall Street are like, you know, really pumped up about their company going public or something where they feel like that's an organizing principle. I remember myself being in the center of a violent 60 person crowd, you know, we'd gotten into an accident and there's a kind of, there is a contagion effect to that. Uh, yeah. And, and you were like, okay, you know, how do I, and, and, and I think there's a bunch of questions around this. Uh, maybe Shay, you can talk about this as well is that, Okay, maybe my love is not enough, uh, but you have a contagion of love, perhaps. Uh, but does that contagion, like, what is the role of proximity in that contagion of love? Like, can we actually have that contagion over Zoom? Can we do that non-locally? So maybe in physical proximity, I'm just there and there's 60 people around me after, you know, after whatever scene. And like, but maybe I'm not there alone. I, I don't know. Like, what, where, what do you, how do you guys uh, think about, think about that? And Shay, I want to also have you respond to Sister Marilyn's uh, um, original question as well. So just adding that into the mix. Yeah, I, I mean, I think there is mob violence, right? There is, there is something around power that can be very seductive, right? Like we see a lot of the world leaders who've been the most harmful, they had a seductive quality, right? There was something that was very attractive about them. And so I, I honestly think we still have a lot to learn about that. I've also been in environments where I felt that energy and it, it is a powerful energy. Like it is a powerful energy. So I don't think we should discount it. I think we should try to understand it more deeply. Um, like, what is that? Why is it so seductive for us? And my sense is it, you know, if we think about sort of stages of human consciousness, I was um, looking at just a very simple description around human consciousness, how we, we sort of come in. This is actually from a book called The Grace in Dying. And she talks about how the world's wisdom traditions have mapped with clarity and great insight the stages of transformation and levels of consciousness or identity intrinsic to the process of human development. They've mapped the process by which we create our sense of self. Each tradition offers an essentially identical ins insight into the fact that existence is graded into several levels. Each level has its own characteristic modes of knowing and identity, its own definition of what is self and what is not self. The progression in the psychological reality of a typical healthy human being is always from a stage that is pre-personal, pre-egoic, pre-rational, undifferentiated, and unindividuated to a stage of consciousness and identity that is personal, egoic, rational, differentiated, and individuated and beyond to one that is transpersonal, transegoic, transrational, integrated and whole. And my sense and understanding of that, right, is that sort of power mongering, mob violence, that is very much about personalization and a building up of a sense of self. That sense of self is a powerful entity. And it's the total identification with that egoic, strong sense of I am that is damn seductive, right? Like we know it. And so how do you move out of that? I think Thich Nhat Hanh gave us a pathway. He said on those boats leaving Vietnam, it took one person, right? To stay with love and to hold that center and you could save a whole boat full of people. And so I think he's right. I mean, he has to be, he, he knows that lived experience so well. Like there, I think Tracy's right. The love is more powerful, but boy, that ego I am is strong, you know? So, yeah. That's, that's super that's interesting really to would say, sorry, just to, just to tack on to that. There's this, there's a, a metric called the ego disillusionment scale <laughs> that's used in a lot of research. And they've come to see that the transformational effect of various interventions, ranging from mindfulness interventions to even psychedelic interventions into some of these other 
healing modalities seem to explicitly target this sense of ego in oneself. And as you break down the perceived sense of I and the ego, which maps onto some of the other work I did regarding the self and the other, it's really about this sense of ego. And as that dissolves, um, you see a lot of healing and transformation take place and um, people feel more connected with, with their life, with themselves, with their loved ones. So that's, that's, mm -hmm. Uh, well, what, one one last question here, uh, and, and this is not science oriented. This is just anecdotal, you know, <laughs> for both of you, uh, of an anecdote where you know uh, Shay cited that beautiful quote about going from pre-individuated to individuated to trans-individuated. Um, what can you share a, a moment where you felt that and it gave you? this intuition. Um, like I, for someone like me, I don't even need research. I'm standing on the, maybe hatred has just as strong a vibe as uh, the collective flow of love, but I'm, I'm on the side of love, you know, like I, I don't need any convincing um, when, and, and we all have those moments, you know? Um, and so I wonder uh, if you could end and, and conclude here with a moment for you that um, purely anecdotal from your experience, zero science involved, but your body responded, your heart responded, and your intuition said, yeah, man, there is something stronger than even that seductive force of I am, that mm -hmm. self that is so, so difficult. Um, so, I mean, not that, I mean, it's not like we have a lot of time left, but still I felt like we should end on a question like that. If something comes up for either one of you, that would be fantastic. I have an immediate, immediate thing that comes up for me, which is, is yeah. was becoming a mother. Becoming a mother mm -hmm. and the love and the transcendence of myself and her, the, 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 the symbiotic relationship that you have with a young child um, for me was, is, continues to be the greatest teacher in transcending the self and um, expanding your heart into another individual's heart and, and the relationship there and, and the, the interconnectedness and, um, and so for me, that was certainly uh, probably the most powerful direct experience of that was, was my daughter's arrival. Wow. Shay, thank you, Tracy. Yeah, certainly as a mother, I can relate to that, Tracy. But I think my answer here is, um, it's actually going to be the opposite almost. It's like, it's all of my failings, you know, it's my it's the mud and the lotus, you know, it's all the things I do wrong every day of my life, you know, it's like, it's somehow there's something in the mud in my own just flawed, you know, making mistakes, not wanting to hurt, but hurting and, you know, there's something in that mud that has been like the greatest teaching of my life has come out of the mud. It really has like, the, the trauma that I've experienced, the pain, the injustice, the cruelty, like all of that is what actually has evolved my being the most, you know, it wasn't like the, for me, it wasn't the joy, even though I love to be joyful, it was, it has been consistently the places in which I fall apart. The places in which I fall apart are my greatest teachings. Um, for this capacity for an evolutionary self that moves into the transpersonal, right? Because there's something about seeing it, like seeing like, oh my God, I'm so, that was such a mm, boy, you know, what was I doing? That somehow it's motivational for me. It's like, no, I will not stay with that. I refuse to stay with that. And so there's something in that, that just, for me, it helps me to evolve, you know, it like pushes into, there are these spaces. And then um, as we've discussed, there are then places of meditation that I can go to resource, you know, and um, align and attain, you know, great love and compassion from those beautiful spots. 
Well, both of you are emitting your your. I forgot the technical term for it, Tracy, but you know the electromagnetic the, fields. <laughs> electromagnetic fields. Boom! I'm feeling smarter just by being on this call. Um, but both of you are, 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 you know, you you do that naturally. And I think to Shay's uh, final point, I think uh, it is inspiring that the human heart unfailingly responds to the advances of love. Um, and I think that's what has uh, kept the long arc of uh, of life uh, going. And I think that's a beautiful uh, that's a beautiful thing to. I think that both of you have affirmed in all of us here today. Um, so thank you for your fantastic work that you have been doing in the world. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for gifting your time in this way on this call. Uh, it's 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 it really is a blessing. And you know there were many questions we didn't get to, but I think these are the kinds of questions. I mean, I don't know if we have answers of how collective coherence works and how you know, where are the boundaries and how much is love stronger than greed and then than anger and where, how do all these come together? But we ought to be just as we are having incredible technological innovations, you know, uh, we ought to be having these or, you know, these kinds of inner innovations um, around, uh, you know, this, this new, new force perhaps uh, that can be ignited if you and I come together in this way. Um, yeah, Trey, we we're going to close with a song, but before that, Tracy, you know, I just closing say, words. If, and Shay, questions, Shay. if you could copy them and send them to me or to Shay, yes. I, I don't want to volunteer. Shay, but, um, I'm happy to get to some of those questions if if um, we have uh, the the people um, if we have yeah. their contact. We absolutely. In fact, we'll be happy to create a little group uh, for people who are interested in coming on. And Tracy, you can, people can ask questions, you can respond. And, and really, even we can all come up with new questions, you know, we can keep the conversation alive. Uh, and I know both of you and I, we're all uh, really committed to keeping the conversation alive. It's not like any of us are super experts and have the divine word on it. But let's fail together, you know, and let's fail along this, this direction. And I think that's a that's a very beautiful thing. Um, so thank you, thank you both uh, tremendously on behalf of uh, of so many people in so many ways. Uh, we want to invite Lynn in Vietnam, uh, one of our uh, volunteers, to close it out uh, with uh, with a song. Um, over to you, Lynn. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you, Shay and Tracy, for such a rich conversation and. I believe that there's uh, this mantra that I offer to the space is everyone's heart uh, desire, wish, dream. It's the, man the, the ancient mantra, Loka Samasta Sukino Bhavantu, which means may all, roughly translated to, may all beings be peace and happiness. So, if you know the mantra, please chant along, sing along, move along with me.
Thank you all um, for being here uh, and sharing this morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you are in the world. I uh, will send follow-up emails. Um, and, you know, Gandhi said that if you want to learn the law of love, somebody asked him, where do you go to learn the law of love? And what did he say? He says, go to little kids. So here we have it, <laughs> the cameo appearance. <laughs> You see you all. Good night.